Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Did you know that the impedance at one end of your feed line is going to be different than the impedance as seen from the other end of that same feed line with only one exception? And what makes things worse, the impedance transformation is frequency dependent. Transmission line theory, more of that RF magic. Well, in this video, I'm going to show you how to predict the impedance at the other end of a feed line if you know a few basic facts. It is useful, for instance, if you're trying to determine the impedance of an antenna that lives at the top of your tower. I'm going to show you two ways to do this. There is the fun way, and then there's the easy way. The fun way requires the use of a Smith chart. Oh, don't, don't let that scare you away. I'm going to do a step-by-step -step process that you can follow. I've provided a link to the free downloadable Smith chart that I use in the description below. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, the Smith chart assumes an ideal lossless feed line and real world feed lines are anything but this. The question is, how much of a difference does this make? And is this difference significant enough to cause us to seek other solutions? I will let you make that determination as you see the results of this exercise. So let's begin the fun way by laying out the things that we need to know. In order to make this RF magic work, we need to collect certain pieces of information about the system we're operating in. Once we have all these pieces of knowledge, then we can do a little simple math to calculate the stuff we need to do the job. So what do we need to know? Well, first, we need to know the specific frequency that we're going to use to make our measurements. The lower the frequency you use to make this measurement, the less the feed line losses will affect the final outcome. We also need to know the physical length of the feed line. And of course, no feed line is ideal, so its electrical length is not the same as its physical length. We need to know the velocity factor of the feed line so that we can calculate the electrical length at the selected frequency. Now, if you don't know the velocity factor of your feed line, then you can measure it if you have access to both ends of the feed line in question. Now, I made a video series on this very topic, and I've put a link to this first one in the series up in the corner for you. Then, we need to carefully measure the impedance at the end of the feed line that we do have access to. Now that we know what we need to know, let's gather the information we need for this demo. This is going to be a walk along with me kind of video, so I'm going to show you what I'm going to do here. At some point in time in the past, I created a special calibrated test load, which is purposely non-ideal. It has resistive, inductive, and capacitive elements in it. I know that it has a measured impedance of 41.11 plus 10.37J at 10 megahertz. This test load will exist at the end of a 76-foot, 2-inch piece of RG8AU coax which has a measured velocity factor of 0.657 and a characteristic impedance of 52 ohms. The test load will be at one end of the feed line, and we will be measuring the impedance as presented on the other end of the feed line. Then we will back calculate to determine the impedance of my test load. We get to see how close the back calculated impedance is as compared to the actual measured impedance of the test load. And now that we have all of the needed information, let's get ready for the process. The first step in preparing for this is to determine the electrical length of our feed line in terms of the wavelength of the chosen frequency. The formula is the physical length in inches at the top all divided by this quantity, the speed of light in inches per second, times the velocity factor, divided by the frequency in hertz. So in our case, we have 914 inches of feed line, where we chose 10 megahertz. 
and the velocity factor is 0.657, which gives us a length of 1.173 wavelengths at 10 megahertz. Next, we have to measure the impedance of our load at the end of the feed line. I've installed our test load at the end of the coax and carefully made a measurement of the impedance as presented at the far end of the feed line. I've measured the impedance at 63.58 minus 2.69J. With the measured impedance and the electrical length of the coax in hand, it's time to dive into the Smith chart and back calculate the test load's impedance. The first thing that we have to do to prepare for our Smith chart work is to get our wavelength stuff figured out. Now each trip around the Smith chart is one half wavelength, so we have to subtract this out of the electrical length of our coax and wavelengths. Now our, our coax is 1.73 wavelengths long at 10 megahertz. That gives us two half wavelengths plus a little bit more in our coax. So we subtract one from its length to get the residual length. So the length that we're interested in for the Smith chart is only 0.173 wavelengths. Next, we have to normalize our measured impedance for the Smith chart. Now the characteristic impedance for the coax is 52 ohms. So our impedance for the Smith chart becomes our measured impedance of 63.58 minus 2.69J, all divided by 52, which gives us 1.223 minus 0.517J. Now that we have everything that we need, let's move on to the Smith chart itself. Before we begin this part of the exercise, if you're interested in learning more about Smith charts, I have a whole series on them. I've put a link to the first one in the series up in the corner for you. Now we have to remember that the Smith chart assumes an ideal lossless feed line. Now there's no such thing as ideal lossless feed lines. This feed line that I'm using has a measured 0.41 dB of loss from end to end at 10 megahertz. The fact that we're talking real world feed line versus ideal feed line will make a difference in the results of our calculations. Now let's see how far off we might be because of this. The first step is to plot the measured impedance on the Smith chart. Next, we draw an SWR circle which passes through our plotted impedance with its center on the center of the Smith chart. Now we draw a line from the center of the Smith chart through our plotted impedance out to the edge of the Smith chart. Now carefully read the number off the second scale from the edge of the Smith chart. In this case, I have 0.238. Now we're going to be moving from the generator, which is our measurement instrument, toward the load, that is my test load out at the end of the coax. So we will be moving counterclockwise around the Smith chart from this point. We will be moving a total of 0.173 wavelengths. So we add this number, to the number we read off the edge of the Smith chart, and that gives us 0.411. Now, look around the edge of the Smith chart until you find 0.411 on the second scale from the edge of the Smith chart and mark this point. Now, we draw a line from this place on the edge through the SWR circle to the center of the Smith chart. Now, we're getting there, just two more steps. Note the spot that this newly drawn line crosses the SWR circle and determine what impedance this represents. Now, using my calibrated eyeball, I get a normalized impedance of 0.895 plus 0.175J. Now we get to unnormalize the impedance by multiplying it by the system impedance of 52 ohms. And we get 46.54 plus 9.1J. So how does this compare to the actual measured impedance of the test load? 
while I measured the test load at an impedance of 41.11 plus 10.37J at 10 megahertz. So let's just think about what we just did. We determined the approximate impedance of an unknown load at the other end of 76 feet of non-ideal feed line. With everything taken in consideration, this back calculated impedance is pretty good approximation in my own view of things. Now, to satisfy my own curiosity, I calibrated my VNA at the end of the coaxial cable where the test load, load would be connected, and then I measured the impedance of the test load. I got 41.13 plus 10.35J, which is almost identical to what I got when I measured it right here up close and personal to the VNA. So obviously the preferred method is to calibrate your VNA at the end of the feed line you're making the measurement through. This is not always possible. Now that I've done all this work and had a blast doing it, I want to point out that there is an easier way to do all of this. We could use the Transmission Line Program for Windows, or TLW, which came with my ARRL and Book 23rd edition. I've put a link to the ARRL zip download for this program in the description for you. Not only does this program do everything we just did, but it also rolls in the effects of the transmission line loss. But it still isn't perfect it didn't end up returning exactly what my test load is. As you can see here, TLW reports that the test load should be 46.73 plus 9.2J. And I calculated here in the fun way, 46.54 plus 9.1J. Whereas the actual measured impedance of the test load is 41.11, plus 10.37J. So we ended up in the same place, a nice approximation of the impedance, but nothing will ever beat measuring the impedance right up close and personal to the load in question. So at this point, you now know how to determine the approximate impedance of an unknown load at the other end of a known piece of feed line at a specified frequency, using both the fun way and the easy way. As you can now see, it is not that tough to do. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.